Kingdom Hearts is a series that I've always been familiar with for as long as I can remember, even if up until earlier this year I had never played any of the games myself from start to finish. But even without ever playing them, just hearing the words Kingdom Hearts immediately evokes nostalgia, as some of my earliest memories with video games were watching my older siblings play Kingdom Hearts 2. Doing odd jobs in Twilight Town as Roxas, exploring the Disney World as Sora, and getting past the controller every once in a while only to shred on the skateboard for hours at a time and not actually play the game at all. And of course, because this was 2006, having to rent the game multiple times from Blockbuster just to beat it. And somehow, 13 or so years later, I still remember watching someone play Kingdom Hearts more so than most of the games I actually played as a kid. And to me now as an adult, I see that as an incredible feat, and really something only Kingdom Hearts was capable of doing due to its bizarre yet charming nature bringing together the worlds of Final Fantasy and Disney, which made some pretty unforgettable moments for my 10-year-old self. So for me, my relationship relationship with Kingdom Hearts was built upon nostalgia, and I don't think I'd be too wrong to assume that's the same for most people, be them longtime fans or just casual observers. But from my initial exposure to Kingdom Hearts, I never thought to get any more into the series as the years passed, and I naively developed the mentality that people enjoy Kingdom Hearts because of their nostalgia, and I would think to myself that it's too late to get into Kingdom Hearts, and it's a series you had to play as a kid to be able to enjoy today. And again, naively, this remained my opinion on the series for many many years, but earlier this year, leading up to the release of Kingdom Hearts 3, it seemed it was the only thing my friends were talking about. Their hopes, expectations, predictions for how the story was going to end, and so on. And after the release of Kingdom Hearts 3, I felt like I was missing out on something the rest of the world was celebrating. And I wasn't even able to talk to my friends for at least a week because they cared so much about the series they didn't want to spoil me on the story on the off chance I ever decided to play the games. And eventually hearing, dude, you gotta play Kingdom Kingdom Hearts pretty much every day, and a genuine curiosity for what makes this ridiculous series so special finally got to me, and I reluctantly pulled out my wallet, emptied my bank account for the Kingdom Hearts all-in-one package. Containing Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 plus 2.5 Remix, Kingdom Hearts 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue, and Kingdom Hearts 3, the game I actually wanted to play. But I've never been one to jump into an ongoing story-driven series at the finale, or even midway, because no one likes the guy that jumps at the end and then complains that nothing makes sense, so it's a bad game. And from past experiences, playing through entire series always makes for a better experience. Knowing the history of a franchise, all of the lore, and everything that led up to the latest installment. So by my own accord, if I wanted to play Kingdom Hearts 3, I first had to play Kingdom Hearts 1, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, Kingdom Hearts 2, Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, Kingdom Hearts Recoded, Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance, Kingdom Hearts 0.2 Birth by Sleep, A Fragmentary Passage, A Shitty Mobile Game, and then then. Kingdom Hearts 3. So in today's video, I'll be telling the story of my journey through the Kingdom Hearts franchise, going over each game I played in the order that I played them, and giving my opinions on them from a mostly nostalgia-free perspective. What I liked, what I didn't like, and seeing if my preconceived notion of the series only being enjoyable if you have nostalgia for it being right or not. Spoiler alert, I was wrong. But a real spoiler warning for those watching that haven't played Kingdom Hearts yet or aren't fully caught up to the series, I won't be giving any explicit story spoilers until later in the video, and there'll be another Another warning when that time comes, but I will be showing gameplay of final boss fights and final worlds, so beware. But with introductions out of the way, let's dive into my reluctant journey through Kingdom Hearts. So it all started back in February of this year, and if you're watching this relatively around the time it's uploaded, you probably noticed that's around 7 months ago. And no, it didn't take me all 7 months of playing to finish, but there was one game in particular that let's just say I wasn't the biggest fan of, that made me take a break from the series for 3 months until I was able to find the willpower and patience to finish it. Leave a comment guessing what game you think it was, and find out later if you were right or not. But back to February and Kingdom Hearts 1. It of course began with that iconic opening cinematic, backed by 
by Hikaru Utada Simple and Clean, which till this day is still probably my favorite Kingdom Hearts opening because Simple and Clean is such a classic and I'm a total sucker for an aquatic theme. Put your characters around water with some great music and I'll love it. It also reminded me a lot of Final Fantasy VIII and X, so we were already off to a great start. The game begins immediately after the opening, surrounded by darkness on a glass stained painting of Snow White, which worked so well as a tutorial level, not only because you got to fight Heartless and everything looked amazing, but also on a narrative level. As one of the first things you hear when you start the game is Sora saying, is any of this real or not? Followed up by the abstract dreamlike cinematic, which then brings you straight into gameplay that expresses those same themes. As Sora wanders from surreal to reality and back again, ending with the first dark side fight, which genuinely feels like a real nightmare, and upon Sora being consumed by darkness, awakes on the shore of the Destiny Islands. And this was such a better introduction to the world of Kingdom Hearts than what I was expecting, which would be more akin to just waking up on the Destiny Islands, Waka offers you a weapon, combat tutorial, boom, start exploring. With the dreamlike state, you get a taste of what's to come later, as well as an introduction to the existence of Disney in the series, so later it doesn't feel too out of place, although it's still pretty weird. But now we're in the game, and it felt about how I expected it to, like a game from 2002 with updated graphics. And that's not to say it felt bad or anything, as around 2002 was when 3D action-adventure platformer games were really hitting their stride, with games like Wind Waker, Mario Sunshine, and Sly Cooper all releasing that same year. So although Sora's movement wasn't perfect, it was good enough considering the circumstances, and same applies to combat. You go through the first few hours of the game with just a three-hit combo, but with great animations and sound design, it never felt too repetitive. And you also had a unique animation for aerial hits, which helped out a lot when you felt like switching things up early on. And lastly, before we get into the thick of the game, I just want to finish summarizing my thoughts on the prologue. I mentioned earlier how the opening reminded me of Final Fantasy VIII and X, and what do you know, when you get to the island, it's Selfie, Titus, and Waka, which was just another small thing early on that was making this game feel incredibly well choreographed. And really, everything about the first hour was nearly perfect, exploring Destiny Island, searching for materials to go sailing on the raft, the introduction of the characters, Kairi as a friend both Sora and Riku have an interest for, and is the spark of their rivalry, which also engages with the player. By making you fight Riku, who is far more powerful, and competing in the race across the island, which works well in making Riku really feel like your rival instead of the game just telling you he is. But once you're done with introductions and exploring, shit gets real as Sora's dreams become a reality, and the Heartless invade his world as you fight against the same boss from the tutorial, but this time with the iconic Keyblade. And it ends with the Destiny Islands being destroyed, Riku embracing the power of darkness, Kairi disappearing, and Sora awakening in a strange new world, Traverse Town. And the last point I want to mention about the prologue is that it does an incredible job with characterization, establishing both Sora and Riku's ideals in a way that expands upon their characters and sets up the role they will play throughout the game. Sora being a charismatic and ambitious child, eager to explore beyond his world and fulfilling the Chosen One archetype which was foreshadowed in the tutorial, who also cares for his friends. And Riku being hungry for power, willing to submit his heart to darkness to achieve his goal, creating the duality of light versus dark that will remain the central theme of the series throughout its entirety. So yeah, I really like the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1, and of course, I didn't think this much about it the first time I played. If anything, I thought it was just average, but it's hard not to see how important the beginning of the series was in retrospect. But now on to the main part of the game, the Disney World's combat, level design, customization, and so on. When you get to Traverse Town, the game really picks up. Final Fantasy and Disney characters are popping out around every corner, and you start to understand what makes Kingdom Hearts special, and why an RPG with Donald and Goofy as your party members works way better than you would expect. The game surprisingly didn't rely on the big Disney names to carry itself, but rather it seamlessly blended the charms and themes of Disney's stories into its own, to create a story and characters not too different from the friends we make along the way. So although from an outsider looking in, seeing Sora, Cloud, and Goofy all next to each other looks pretty ridiculous. In practice, they complement each other well and make strong, believable friendships. But this is a game after all, so all of this great characterization and use of Disney's IPs could easily be shattered by poor gameplay and level design. But thankfully, Kingdom Hearts nails both. Like I mentioned earlier, you spend a lot of the early game using your three-hit combo, but quickly you start to unlock more abilities, providing combo extenders and action commands like Sonic Blade, as well as magic spells like Fire, Ice, and Thunder that can be used for different situations like attacking from range and AoE damage for crowd control. Although, if I'm being honest, the magic was not as useful as I thought it would be, as some of the spells can be difficult to connect with or just don't provide enough damage for the amount of MP they consume, and I found myself slashing my way through 
most mob encounters, and by endgame, really the only spells I was using were Arrow, the wind spell for the defense buff, Cure for heals, and Gravity to deal with flying enemies. For everyone else, and especially bosses, it seemed the Keyblade was the way to go. So for the most part, the combat was fairly simple and even repetitive near the final Disney worlds. The only frustrating part of it was dealing with enemies in high places, like in Hollow Bastion where the game places ground enemies right on the edge of the platform and flying enemies completely off, and when Sora is comboing attacks, he is always moving forward, and can easily fall off ledges sending you all the way to the bottom of the world with one button press too many. In my first playthrough, I probably fell off of Hollow Bastion at least 15 times, so here's where spells like Thunder can come in handy. But as for the level design, aka the worlds where you'll be spending a majority of the game, is where its age showed the most. Regardless of how good the game looked with its updated visuals, the worlds very much felt like I was back in 2002. But just because the levels were designed with the hardware limitations of the PS2 doesn't make them bad at all. I actually found that the levels were cleverly designed to feel bigger than they actually were through density, like Wonderland, Monstro, and Agrabah, as they were designed more like puzzles to keep you engaged exploring previous locations trying to find what door or alleyway leads to a new area. But something I noticed about halfway through the game was that not all worlds were created equal. As when I got to Halloween Town, I was pretty hyped to play through my favorite Disney movie, but by the end, I was disappointed that the world felt so small, mostly because it lacked the density of worlds like Agrabah that felt huge in comparison, and almost like two worlds in one with the city and then the Cave of Wonders. But in retrospect, it's not the biggest deal and may even be a good thing for pacing, it's just unfortunate that some of your favorite Disney IPs may have been much smaller worlds than others you don't really care about. And before we move on from the Disney worlds, let me just throw some of my opinions out there. Favorite world, Agrabah, least favorite, Neverland, and most frustrating, Deep Jungle. Although I admit Deep Jungle may have been my own fault, because I guess I didn't get the memo that you could press X to auto jump from one vine to the other, so instead for 30 minutes I was jumping by pressing circle, and just praying for dear life that Sora would latch on to the next vine, while falling all the way to the bottom 50% of the time. Also in Deep Jungle, what was the point of this wall right here that you could shimmy across? It looks like there's something secret behind the vines, but I couldn't figure it out, or maybe it was just pointless. But by the end of all the Disney worlds and the story begins to converge, you reach the third Kingdom Hearts original world, Hollow Bastion, which still, till this day, is one of, if not the best world in all of Kingdom Hearts in my opinion. To me, Hollow Bastion encapsulated everything this game has to offer in one world. A powerful and dramatic aesthetic, decent platforming segments, fun combat against a variety of unique Heartless, intuitive puzzle design, challenging boss fights, a whole lot of progression, and scale. This world is massive in comparison to the rest of the game, and has an amazing sense of progression as you work your way up the castle and regain your powers along the way. Yeah, I didn't mention that you lose your Keyblade at the beginning of this world, and then Donald and Goofy are just like, okay, see you later, but that has to do with plot details, and I want to save my thoughts on the story until the end. So to wrap up my thoughts on the final worlds, Hollow Bastion is amazing, and the final world, cleverly named the End of the World, really tested my patience and was a long, difficult battle all the way to the end. And I have I haven't talked much about difficulty yet, and that's because the game really didn't give me any trouble until the final fights, but holy shit, some of those final fights had me the most frustrated I have ever been playing a video game before, and not frustrated due to bad mechanics or unfair enemy design, just pure difficulty that really tested my skills and knowledge of the game, pushing me to use every resource I had, and I only played the game on standard. I remember during the Heartless mobs, before the final rest, I really had to experiment with every summon I had, and I eventually beat it by customizing Donald and Goofy's playstyles to heal just as much as possible and loaded them up with potions and ethers, and that was a feature I didn't even know the game had until the difficulty pushed me to try everything. And right after that is the Ansem fight, which for me was tough as nails. I'm pretty sure during this fight was one of the only times I can remember actually yelling at a game and feeling so overwhelmed by defeat, I seriously think I could have cried after dying when he only had a sliver of health remaining. So yeah, for me, the end of Kingdom Hearts was really Really hard, but after defeating each enemy that felt impossible at first had an equal feeling of satisfaction. Also, I was not expecting how long the end of the world was going to be, granted some of the boss fights did take me multiple hours to beat, but the game just felt like it was never going to end. First you gotta traverse your way through the world fighting mobs along the way, then fight a mob from every Disney world in the game, then the really hard wave style fight right before the final rest, and then you fight the final boss a whole 15 times it feels like, and each fight you're saying there's no way there's another fight after 
after this, but then yeah, there is another fight after this, until eventually you're in a void of darkness fighting the goddamn Starship Enterprise of Heartless with a jumbo-sized Ansem Seeker of Darkness on top, swinging around a double-sided Spear of Darkness. But yeah, it felt really good when I beat him. So lastly for Kingdom Hearts 1 is the story. It was good, I liked it. It was pretty simple, but gave the impression that it was part of something bigger, which is perfect for the first game. It also did a great job of incorporating the Disney worlds and characters into its overarching plot, so each world you visited felt like it had a purpose and you were there for a reason, as well as this game being the first time Sora is exploring new worlds, so even if a certain world wasn't that important to the story, it still felt important to Sora. But unfortunately, this concept of giving purpose to your journey is seriously ignored as the series continues, and what I thought could be improved in future games turned out to be at its best in Kingdom Hearts 1, as I believe this game is the best in the series when it comes to its use of Disney and pacing. But speaking of the series continuing, I realized something while replaying Kingdom Hearts 1, and it's that once you've played the rest of the series, it kind of ruins this game's story. As my first time playing, it was simple and straightforward, with just the right amount of subtle twists throughout, like Kairi's heart being inside of yours from the beginning, and the Keyblade choosing you over Riku. But when I played for a second time, so many parts of the story are overcomplicated in future games to make it seem like Kingdom Hearts 1 was this grand setup for games 10 years from now and it was all planned out from the beginning, when no it wasn't. But that concludes my experience with Kingdom Hearts 1, and if you couldn't tell already, I really like this game, and it made my journey through Kingdom Hearts feel not so reluctant anymore. I started a Twitter thread as I played through all of the games where I gave my brief opinions on them as I finished, and according to my posts, I beat Kingdom Hearts 1 in under 48 hours, with a total playtime of 33 hours, and I guarantee at least 10 of those were just from the end of the world. So anyways, I talked about Kingdom Hearts 1 for a while, but don't worry, we'll be moving quicker throughout the other titles because this was the first one after all, and introduced me to a whole bunch of new characters, themes, and gameplay mechanics that the other games will also feature. So on to the next game in the series that I played, Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories. Chain of Memories was a unique experience I really wasn't expecting because apparently I did play this game as a kid, or at least a little bit of it, and the general concept of Chain of Memories is to find is to lose and to lose is to find, as the game takes place in a world called Castle Oblivion where the further into the castle you go, the more memories you lose. So the game revolved around memories, hence the title, and it was a cool feeling playing the game and with each new world and cutscene remembering bits and pieces from my own past I had completely forgotten about. It was specifically the way that you open doors in this game, and when I saw that screen selecting what card to use on the door, it immediately brought me back to the most random memory from my childhood. I don't know what year it was, but I was in my mom's car, outside of a Halloween party, trying to figure out how to open these goddamn doors. I was probably 9 years old or something at the time, so I probably had no idea how the card mechanics worked to this game at all. Hell, I'm an adult and I still don't think I understand it fully. But even with that novelty, it still wasn't enough to bring me to finishing. I made it about 7 hours into the game until I decided to skip it. I really didn't like the card and deck building mechanic that the combat was built upon, but the main reason I decided to skip the game was because I was playing all of the same worlds I had just played in Kingdom Hearts 1, and this time they weren't even the real thing, they were just Sora's memory of them, so none of the characters were even real. And also in this game you play as Riku through his adventure in Castle Oblivion, and you have to re-replay the same worlds from Kingdom Hearts 1. No thank you. So the way I saw it was that I could either power through it, play all the same worlds with a worse combat system I didn't even enjoy, or just watch all the cutscenes and move on to that very enticing Kingdom Hearts 2 just chilling at the title select screen. So yeah, I skipped it. I'm not proud of it, but it happened. I actually felt some guilt about skipping this game about a month ago, and I tried out the Game Boy Advance version to see if it was any better played on the platform it was originally designed for, and no, not really. I made it through Agrabah and Wonderland, but was still not not digging the card mechanics, and honestly, because this game's story is so important to every game that comes after, I feel like it was better to just watch the cutscenes instead of trying to follow its pretty complicated plot throughout a 30 hour playthrough, with some meaningless Disney worlds interrupting the important cutscenes. So from just watching the game, I had a pretty good understanding of what was going on, and I also have to thank this game for one of my favorite dialogue exchanges in the entire series. Because I'm you. No, I'm me. I'm me, he says. 
So Chain of Memories, I didn't like the combat system or the concept of exploring the worlds of Sora's memories, but I did really like the story as it introduced more complex narratives with the organization and as we'll see soon enough was a brilliant setup to Kingdom Hearts 2. It's just unfortunate that such an important story that will ripple throughout every game in the series is tied to its combat system, which I personally just found not fun and required more patience than I was willing to spare. And it's also unfortunate that this trend of putting incredibly important plots into handheld games with each having their own unique combat system will be continuing. But for now, let's say goodbye to Chain of Memories and move on to the next game in the series I played, Kingdom Hearts 2. In the menu of 1.5 plus 2.5, it has 358 Days Over 2 listed before Kingdom Hearts 2, but I knew that Days was a DS game that released after it, so I went to my friend for advice who's been playing the series since forever, and he recommended me to play Kingdom Hearts 2 first, because although Days technically comes first chronologically, apparently it would spoil what he said was one of the best reveals and character arcs in the entire series. So I took his advice, and it was for sure the way to go, and I would recommend anyone playing the series for the first time to do the same. So on to Kingdom Hearts 2, which is the game I had the strongest feelings of nostalgia for and was really looking forward to getting back to Twilight Town and seeing Roxas again, but this time actually understand the story. And now being able to look back on the game and even having played it for a second time, I truly believe that the prologue to Kingdom Hearts 2 is one of, if not the best first few hours of any game I've ever played. It's a bittersweet experience and something I definitely wouldn't have said my first time playing, as the game goes above and beyond to ensure you have no idea what's happening. Especially Especially if you've never played or watched Chain of Memories, as you play as a character you've never met, in a world you've never seen, where everything around you feels as if it's falling apart at the seams. Characters can't finish their sentences and time is standing still, with even more anomalies around every turn. But by the end, your few hours of confusion are rewarded with answers as the pieces fall into place to reveal the bigger picture, and what initially felt like time being wasted is revealed to be bringing you towards exactly what you wanted, as two become one in a tragic yet blissful reunion. Until this day, I believe that this was the best writing in the Kingdom Hearts series and only gets better with time, being able to look back at everything and replay with the knowledge of future games like Days, which explains even more of the interactions between characters and creates a stronger thematic emphasis on tragedy through Roxas and his relationships. It all just worked, especially when considering how Roxas' story tied together moments from Kingdom Hearts 1 and subsequently introduced new concepts to the series like Nobody's that would be the focus of Kingdom Hearts 2. So what first felt distant from our memories with Kingdom Hearts 1 by the end became a true sequel to Sora's story and showed us the repercussions of our actions from the first game. And if you couldn't tell already, I'm really tiptoeing here trying to keep my thoughts relatively spoiler free, but I assume most people interested in my story will have already played the games. And if you have, you'll know exactly the context to what I've been talking about, but if you haven't, I hope it's getting you interested enough to maybe give the games a chance. But that about wraps up my thoughts on the prologue, so now we can get into the gameplay, as once you take control of Sora, you go through a little bit more set up like leaving Twilight Town, which ended with a surprisingly emotional moment between Roxas and his friends that never actually met him but still made a connection with their hearts. We then head over to the mysterious tower, get introduced to Yen Sid or Disney backwards, get some fresh new threads, and then we are thrown into the bulk of the game, which is exploring brand new Disney worlds alongside our old friends Donald and Goofy. And I thought it was hilarious that when Sora was sleeping in Castle Oblivion, he got older so he outgrew his clothes, which was single-handedly the most logical thing that has ever happened in this entire entire series before. But now finally we're in the game, and the first time you get to fight as Sora is when I started to understand why people consider Kingdom Hearts 2 the best in the series. Sora's movement is fast and responsive, and really feels like he's mastered the Keyblade, no longer struggling to swing it around like in Kingdom Hearts 1 or like Roxas. And pretty much everything about the gameplay and combat had been vastly improved upon. The camera is further back and higher up, so it doesn't feel like you're on the ground looking up at everything anymore, thank god, as well as tons of new customization options. More gear, more shortcut commands, and you can now set items to your shortcut menu and set those items to auto refill after each encounter as long as you have more of them in your stock, which was like the best new addition to this game's UI in my opinion. There was also an overhaul to the MP gauge with the addition of MP charge, which I wasn't a fan of at first because casting cure depleted your entire MP gauge no matter how much or little MP you had. And the only reason I was able to beat Starship Enterprise Ansem was by absolutely spamming cure, but I guess the game wanted to make it so you didn't rely so much on healing 
healing and instead focused on avoiding attacks, counterattacking more thoughtfully, and managing your cure spell as a limited resource. Which I grew to understand and appreciate the more I played. Another new addition to combat was the drive mechanic, where you could sacrifice either Donald or Goofy for a form change gaining their abilities of brute strength or spell power through valor and wisdom form, and even more forms later on. So the drives were cool and all, and made Sora feel like a god among Keyblade wielders, but I kinda ran into a huge problem with them nearing the end of the game, but we'll talk about that when we get to difficulty. As for the last new mechanic I want to mention, we have reaction commands, which aren't brand new, but there were a whole lot of them in this game, and more commonly it felt like was the abundance of quick time events. Which had me worried for future boss fights when I played the tutorial, as half of the fight against the Twilight Thorn is just pressing triangle. But then I remembered that this game was released in 2006, and much like Kingdom Hearts 1, these games are products of their time, and around 2006 was when QTEs were really being popularized by titles like Resident Evil 4. But thankfully, although they were in almost every boss fight in the game, they weren't intrusive at all and found a strong balance between player control and moments of mid-fight cinematics. That sometimes made fights more dynamic, but even when they didn't, they still looked really damn cool, like pressing triangle to slash entire buildings in half. And I really can't complain, because without them, we wouldn't have one of the best moments in the Kingdom Hearts series, the Riku and Sora reflect spam. So to move on from the new combat mechanics into level design, I was surprised to see that Kingdom Hearts 2 had a very different approach to its worlds than Kingdom Hearts 1. We talked earlier about Kingdom Hearts 1's clever illusion of scale through density and puzzle-like design, but this time around, the worlds were definitely bigger, but that didn't necessarily make them better, as each world was comprised of a handful or more areas with very flat landscapes and almost none of the platforming elements from the first game. And something about them just lacked the charm from Kingdom Hearts 1, which might have been due to a lot of the worlds being extremely monotone with a single color dominating each area. Although it's pretty obvious the flatter and more barren world design is a result of the game's improved combat system and wider field of view. And when considering how much space Sora requires to execute a lot of his ground and air combos, the level design doesn't seem as bad as it looks. So I did miss the more compact and thoughtful design from the first game, but if you imagine putting Kingdom Hearts 2 Sora with the wider camera in any Kingdom Hearts 1 world, it kinda sounds like a nightmare and would be incredibly claustrophobic, bashing into walls and falling off platforms every combo. So I suppose the less imaginative world design is a fair trade-off for the amount of depth in the new combat system. And to conclude my thoughts on the worlds, during Kingdom Hearts 2 is when I slowly started to realize that I don't really like the Disney side of Kingdom Hearts that much, especially when you reach the halfway point of the game and there is some incredible Kingdom Hearts original content, but then you have to go to every world again to close a second keyhole for a reason I couldn't be bothered to remember. And I'm not sure if not liking the Disney side of the game is blasphemy or anything in the Kingdom Hearts community, but every game after Kingdom Hearts 2, I couldn't help but imagine the potential of a game without it. As the best parts of all of the games, at least to me, are the beginning and the end, and the middle is fun at times, but it's far from the reason why I'm playing. And especially later on in the series, when the story gets vastly more complicated, just imagine a 20 to 25 hour Kingdom Hearts experience with a narrative as tightly woven as the first few hours of Kingdom Hearts 2, but all the way through. But that's just my opinion, and I'm sure a lot of people love the Disney, and I would too a lot more if it was as important as it was in, say, Kingdom Hearts 1. But moving on, I think that concludes my first mini rant this video, and we'll probably see another one later on. So continuing through Kingdom Hearts 2, there was so much I loved about this game my first playthrough, and I could talk about it for hours and would still forget some things. So I'll start to wrap up this segment with difficulty, story, and just a few smaller things. So I again played on standard as I was way too afraid of proud or critical after my experience with the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, but this turned out to be a mistake, as I kinda just breezed through the game without having to put too much thought into my ability points, and since the game is always handing you AP boost, by the end I very stupidly had about every ability equipped. But in my defense, it is hard as a first time player to know how to properly use your AP, and when almost every skill starts out with the words unleash a powerful something, it's hard not to equip it. But even my poorly optimized skills didn't make much of a difference on standard, so since the game was fairly easy, I wasn't using my drives very often. And apparently I missed the memo that you unlock your essential movement abilities through leveling your drives, which I also didn't know you could do. So by the time I reached the Roxas fight in the world that never was, I had a rude awakening, and I eventually had to look up a video on how to beat him, and I saw this man double jumping, dodge, rolling, swooshing through the air, I was shocked, and realized I had none of these mobility options which were essential to beating the fight. So I figured out about the whole drive leveling system and had to grind all of my forms to level 3 for a solid few hours. Which kinda killed the pacing of the final world, but was worth it and made the game feel a whole lot better and I 
Cannot believe I went through the entire game without a fucking dodge roll. So if I played on a higher difficulty, I would have been using my drives more often for the damage and health recovery, as well as would have gotten a better understanding for the possible AP customization. So learn from my mistakes and play the game on proud, or just pay attention to the tutorials. But now lastly, we have the game's story, which when it was happening was really great. We already talked about how much I enjoyed the beginning, and the middle was equally as enjoyable. With more scale and a darker tone than I was expecting, like the invasion of Hollow Bastion and the 1000 Heartless fight where Goofy dies and Mickey claims his revenge. And by the final world, the world that never was, I feel like it was these few hours that really made people fall in love with Kingdom Hearts. It's funny to think back on when I first finished Kingdom Hearts 2, because one of the things I remember hearing about the series before playing was how apparently it had such a complicated story with a whole lot of retcons and nonsense thrown in for good measure. So when I was playing, I made sure to really pay attention to the story, and even up until the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, I felt like I had a good understanding of what was going on. And I thought that I was either really smart or everyone else was just dumb if they thought that this was overcomplicated. But little did I know that up until Kingdom Hearts 2 was just the little leagues of convoluted storytelling, and later on when we get to Dream Drop Distance, that shit is the major leagues. And I'd be laughing at myself for ever suggesting that Kingdom Hearts has a comprehensive storyline. But for how good Kingdom Hearts 2's storytelling was, it introduced some trends and more complicated rules to the series. Like how pretty much everything can be explained by the power of heart. Like, how did the real Hainer Pence Nolette seem to remember Roxas when they never met him? Well, apparently Roxas's heart made a connection with their real hearts through their data versions. And after the Roxas fight in the world that never was, we get a scene of him back in Twilight Town talking to Axel. But I was confused when this was taking place, but apparently it was just inside of Roxas's heart, and that was the real Axel, so okay. The whole power of hearts, and especially going into people's hearts, just seemed like an abuse plot device to express whatever the writers wanted to at any moment. But but in the grand scale of things, it's only a minor complaint, and of course the concept is used in some incredibly badass ways like when Sora will go inside the antagonist's heart and be transported to an unrealistic setting where everything looks really cool and makes for some great final fights. And before we wrap up Kingdom Hearts 2, I realized I haven't talked about the gummy ship at all so far this video, and I'm really not a big fan of it. It was just alright in Kingdom Hearts 1, granted I never bothered with upgrades or customization, but in Kingdom Hearts 2, it was vastly more engaging and way more dynamic than the first game making it actually fun sometimes. And that about concludes not all but most of my thoughts on Kingdom Hearts 2, which was by far my favorite game in the series after finishing, and unlike any other game, when I finished Kingdom Hearts 2, I felt like I had only scratched the surface of what this game had to offer in terms of combat, collectibles, and boss fights, which made me excited to return to it in the future. So with another main entry down, let's get into the next game in the series, Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. For the sake of time, I'll be grouping together 358 Days Over 2 and Recoded because I didn't play these titles as they're only available on the Nintendo DS and are packaged together with 1.5 plus 2.5 as movies, which is just all of the cutscenes reanimated in higher quality with voice acting. So starting with 358 Days Over 2, which is how I believe you say this game's title and not 358 Over 2 Days because you follow a story that spans 358 days through two characters. But anyways, I really don't think just watching the cutscenes gives any meaning to this title whatsoever, as two hours went by and I was absolutely bored out of my mind, and not able to follow anything that was happening as everything the characters were saying felt so meaningless because I didn't have any context. So I stopped the movie about halfway and figured it would be better to just watch a retrospective or something, and after watching videos from channels like Clemps and King K, which were really good, I felt like I had a much better understanding of the game's themes, purpose, and what the hell was actually going on and when it was going on. So yeah, I really think that just putting all of the cutscenes together does very little but waste a lot of your time and doesn't properly express this game's themes. I'm sure watching this movie would be a lot better if you had already played the game before or you already knew what happened in this title, but from a first time viewing experience, I feel like it would be difficult to walk away from it with even a general idea of what actually happened, as for a majority of the time, you're just watching Axel and Roxas on the clock tower eating ice cream. And the story of Days is something I'm really glad I took the extra time to understand because it was surprisingly way darker than anything that came before with 
some really mature themes that gave such greater meaning to the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2. It was after understanding days that truly made me love Kingdom Hearts 2's prologue, and it's cool to see moments in the series when it's clear that the story was planned out in advance. Like the interactions between Roxas and Axel that wouldn't be fleshed out until a whole other game released. And if you ever noticed how in the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2, Roxas picks up a stick and swings it around multiple times, apparently even those small moments are given a deeper meaning in days. As in days, Roxas offers his friend Shion his keyblade and he uses a wooden stick instead. And it's moments like that that make replaying the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2 after knowing what happens in days so much more fulfilling, as you can see Roxas still has lingering memories of his time in the organization. So days is pretty cool, and I would maybe someday actually play it, but it's the same problem as Chain of Memories, where the series throws its important lore that's integral to understanding the main entries on handhelds, with most of the time no voice acting and worse gameplay mechanics. And on the subject of that, we have Recoded, which I watched after playing Birth by Sleep, but it'll be easier to just get this one out of the way now. Recoded seemed to be the most spin-off of all the games, and although it takes place after Kingdom Hearts 2, it's all about tying off loose ends from the past, and done so in the most Kingdom Hearts fashion imaginable by recreating a simulation of memories alongside a data version of Sora to act as a debugging program to go through all of the Disney worlds from Kingdom Hearts 1 once again. So Recoded is by far the most negligible game in this series, and really the only important thing that came out of this game, at least that I can remember, is the final cutscene of Mickey and Yen Sid, where apparently everything we did in the first two games, defeating Ansem and Xemnas, were actually all part of their somebody Master Xehanort's master plan, which is the setup for the next game, Dream Drop Distance. But before we can go forward, we have to go back to the past, 10 years before the events of Kingdom Hearts 1, and the next game I played, Birth by Sleep. I didn't know much before going into Birth by Sleep, pretty much just that this game would introduce the true antagonist for the rest of the series' current saga being this bald guy, and that you play the game as three different characters. I remember watching the trailer for Birth by Sleep online way back in the day, circa 2008, and of course, like every kid at the time, we all thought it was Kingdom Hearts 3 and that Ventus was Roxas. But by the time the game actually released, my interest for the series had faded, and it wouldn't be possible to have that same experience I had with Kingdom Hearts 2. Huddled around the TV with my siblings and taking turns playing because Birth by Sleep was released on another handheld, this time being for the PSP. So earlier this year when I jumped into the game it took a bit of adjusting to get used to because I had started it the day after finishing Kingdom Hearts 2, which is arguably the most fluid and mechanically sound game in the entire series. So the more zoomed in camera, slower character movements, and dare I say floaty combat felt poor in comparison. But after the first character campaign, which only took an afternoon or so, the game felt totally fine. And really to get into the game now, I mentioned earlier that you play as three characters in Birth by Sleep, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, going through three separate campaigns for each character, which is essentially just playing the game three times, but with unique areas, boss fights, and stories for each character. Although the big picture plot is still the same for all three characters, they each just have their own unique struggles they're dealing with throughout the way, and play an important role leading up to the game's climax, which made the three separate storylines feel way more exciting to play than I initially thought they would be. Because once you finish Terra, you're like, oh man, that was pretty great, I wonder what Ventus was up to the whole time, and then you play Ventus's story, and then you say the same thing about Aqua. And since the storylines were pretty short and could easily be played through in one sitting, I found the pacing of this game to be almost perfect, mostly because you could knock out a Disney World in less than an hour and even shorter on your second and third playthrough. And speaking of the Disney Worlds, I expected to go through them similarly to Kingdom Hearts 2, just generally keep the peace, meet some new friends, and help out with whatever Disney bullshit is going on. But to my surprise, most of the worlds you visit are pretty purposeful and taught whatever character you're playing a valuable lesson lesson about either themselves or their relationships. And since everyone goes through all the same worlds, you can see the results of characters' actions and the impact they left on the world rippled throughout the other characters' experiences, which was pretty cool and made each campaign feel personalized, being anything but a simple copy and paste. But what I thought was the best part of this game being broken up into three separate stories was the impact it had on the gameplay experience. So I played the game in order of the characters listed, Terra, Ventus, and Aqua last, and when playing as Terra, I didn't give much thought to the combat system 
system or the more cryptic mechanics and just kind of used whatever abilities I thought sounded good and liked to use. And that worked for the most part, although it made Terra's final fight really damn hard with a command deck full of random abilities, but it was still possible. So when I moved on to Ventus's campaign, I was able to start the game from the beginning with the knowledge of everything I learned through Terra's. So this time I knew what abilities were good, I knew what I wanted to level up, as well as how the form system worked and was reliably going into my favorite command styles, making the game easier and generally just more fun. And by the time I got to Aqua, I felt like a damn Keyblade Master, and it was by far my favorite campaign because again I was able to start over with even more experience of the game's mechanics, and was just destroying everything in Blade Charge for pretty much the entire game, which for me was really fun. But now let's take a look at some of those new mechanics I just mentioned, like the command deck and command styles. So the command deck is what I feel to be an improvement upon the combat system in Chain of Memories, as you have a large variety of attacks in your inventory that you earn through combat or buying from shops, and you have a deck that you can put those moves into. But thankfully this time around, it's a lot more simple. None of your commands can be broken by any number values, and after using a move, they simply go into cooldown, and you can still attack using X without using the command deck, so you never have to worry about being unable to fight if you use all of your commands. So for the most part, I didn't hate the command deck, but I also didn't love it, as later in the game when you have 8 commands in your deck and you can only see 3 at a time, and you have to cycle through them all manually, it can be pretty annoying trying to get the exact command you want, all while keeping an eye on your enemy and avoiding attacks. And remember earlier how I said you get better at the game each playthrough? Well, my first time fighting Terra Xehanor as Terra, I remember just saying screw the command deck and stacking all 8 slots with high potions, because every time I tried to command on him he would either punish me or just be invulnerable. So yeah, I was pretty bad my first time, but by Aqua Story I found it was best to fill the deck with 2 attacks stacked at 3 of a kind and 2 cure spells. So if I wanted to use the Blade Charge command style I would have 3 fire spells, 3 blizzard spells, and 2 cure spells. And speaking of Blade Charge, command styles were another new mechanic introduced in this game, which are similar to drive forms from Kingdom Hearts 2, but this time you transform by using specific commands to fill up your style gauge. So if you want Blade Charge you need to use fire and blizzard or just physical attacks together. I actually really like this mechanic even more than the drive forms because they were more engaging to pull off instead of just pressing a button and made combat more thoughtful by comboing attacks together while working towards a goal more than just defeating your enemy. There was also this melding mechanic in the game that I really didn't bother with at all, where you can meld commands together to make them more powerful and give them new attributes or something, but I'm not too sure. I tried it out once or twice, but just ended up getting a worse command than I put in, because the game doesn't tell you what you're gonna get, and I found it wasn't necessary to use on standard. And I'm sure all of the Birth by Sleep completionists are cursing my name right now, because it seemed like a pretty important mechanic that could net some pretty insane results, but I, I couldn't be bothered. There was also D-Links, which was another mechanic I couldn't be bothered to use after its tutorial. It just didn't seem necessary to call upon a friend and get their command deck, because you build your command deck specific to use and to get the forms you want, so when you call upon another friend, I guess they give you HP or something if I remember correctly, but yeah, I don't want your command deck, no. And the last new mechanic in this game, I think, was the focus gauge, which again, didn't seem that necessary, but it turned out to be pretty helpful in later boss fights for chip damage and invincibility frames. Even though some of the moves you could pull off with the focus gauge felt a bit cheap at times, because it was just complete invincibility frames. So to move on from combat to level design, the worlds were more or less the same as Kingdom Hearts 2, just scaled down for the PSP with a little bit more platforming. But nothing too innovative for the series was going on here. And that brings us to the game story, I thought Birth by Sleep was going to be the game that begins the series dive into convolution, with the introduction of so many new characters and a villain that would somehow be connected to the games that came before. But to my surprise, Birth by Sleep tells a fairly self-contained story that is really focused on its characters more than anything else. Although the game does tie together the previous titles in many ways and shows how the trio who at first were all strangers are actually connected to the series' main characters and antagonists in some way. But I will admit things get a bit complicated at the end of the game when you see the result of the battle at the Keyblade Graveyard, like Ventus's connection to Sora and the origin of both Ansem's Seeker of Darkness and Xemnas. But at the end of the day, I think this game did a phenomenal job at truly introducing Xehanort into the series and providing one of the most mature games in the entire series. And I really love this game because it's probably the closest we'll ever get to a full game without Disney, but rather completely focused on the Kingdom Hearts story. So final thoughts on Birth by Sleep. Gameplay was enjoyable, but not perfect, and same can be said for the worlds, but this game's story was top notch, right up there with Kingdom Hearts 2, if not better in terms of pacing, character development, and its dramatic finale. Which made for probably the best cinematic in the entire Kingdom Hearts franchise with the trio fighting an almost impossible
multiple battle against Master Xehanort, and everyone's final fights were incredible. Playing as Terra's lingering will, fighting for his own body, Ventus's literal internal struggle against Vanitas, and Aqua fights Bragg, which was still good. And she gets her true final fight later against Terra Xehanort, who is now in control of the Guardian from Kingdom Hearts 1. The one thing I enjoyed most about this game was how mature it was for a Kingdom Hearts title, showing that there are no winners in a war, and there's no happy ending of our game jumping around at the Destiny Islands. Rather, the result of our fight is Terra losing his own body to Xehanort and resides within himself as a prisoner. Ventus is unable to wake up, stuck in a state of sleep in between light and dark, and Aqua is trapped in the realm of darkness where it feels as if time stands still. But the flickering light of hope at the end of all of this is the everlasting connections they made with Sora, Riku, and Kairi. So after finishing my first playthrough of Birth by Sleep, I don't think I would have said I enjoyed it more than Kingdom Hearts 2, but to look back at the game in retrospect with its combat system as a distant memory, I really think this game is my favorite whole story in the franchise from start to finish. And like Kingdom Hearts 2, I could talk about this game for at least an hour, going into Vanitas, the Unversed, Master Ericus, the Keyblade, how goddamn cool the Keyblade armor was, and how this game had the most fulfilling conclusion so far. That really made me sit back and rethink so many moments from the previous games after knowing what had happened in the past, which started to fill in the missing pieces to the 1000 piece puzzle that is Kingdom Hearts. But that concludes Birth by Sleep, and brings us to the next game in the series, Dream Drop Distance. If you remember earlier in the video, I mentioned that there was a game in the series that made me take a break from playing for three months, and by process of elimination, I'm sure most of you guys could guess by now, that game was Dream Drop Distance, and you would be right. But before I get into the reason why this game made me set the series down for a while, we'll start off as we have been this entire video, and I'll wait to talk about my issues with the game when we get there. So Dream Drop Distance is the last full game before Kingdom Hearts 3, and because so, its story is pretty much a giant setup to the conclusion of the Xehanort saga. And I guess the series creator, Tetsuya Nomura, had a lot of storytelling he wanted to do before Kingdom Hearts 3, and dumped pretty much all of it into yet another handheld game, this time being originally released for the 3DS. But of course, I played the remake that was included in 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue, and hey, we finally made it past 1.5 plus 2.5, and it only took about 45 minutes. Not bad. So Dream Drop is a direct sequel story-wise to the end of Kingdom Hearts Recoded of all games, where Sora and Riku answer Master Yen Sid's call to begin their Mark of Mastery exam, to prepare for the impending battle between the newly constructed Xehanort, because I guess defeating both Ansem Seeker of Darkness and Xemnas just wasn't enough to become a Keyblade Master. And I know people love to joke on this plot point where Terra and Aqua just had to hit some balls around for their exam, but Riku and Sora have to go on an entire journey through seven sleeping worlds. But I guess it does make sense, because back in Birth by Sleep, it was way simpler times, and in current day, there are still worlds out there that need saving, and Sora and Riku need to prepare for their hardest battle yet, so why not two birds with one stone? And those sleeping worlds I just mentioned are a new type of world introduced in this game where the previous worlds that have been liberated from darkness weren't fully restored and parts of them remain in a deep sleep. They require unlocking a special sleeping keyhole to awaken, and like many parts of this game, it makes me ask, what does that even mean? Dream Drop Distance has garnered the reputation of the game that really messed up the plot of Kingdom Hearts and made a somewhat difficult series to understand full-blown nonsensical. And for the the most part, I would have to agree that this game does more harm than good for the series story, and I wouldn't even say it's a problem of overcomplicating things, rather it just removes any and all rules from the Kingdom Hearts universe. To the point where if the writers want to explain something that happened in a previous game, rather than connecting those plot points using the logic and rules the series has already established, they'll just introduce two, three, maybe even four major new concepts to the universe that will inevitably have to be taken into consideration in future titles and become intense integral parts of the game's lore. But I'll go into more specifics to that point later on. For now, let's get back to the beginning of the game. So you start your Mark of Mastery exam and dive into the sleeping worlds, the first of which being Traverse Town. And this game's prologue had the best surprise in the entire series for me so far, where the main cast from The World Ends With You are in Traverse Town participating in the Reapers game. And if you couldn't tell already from the music I've been using in this video, I'm a big fan of The World Ends With You. And I thought it was so cool that the only other video game characters to appear in Kingdom Hearts besides Final Fantasy 
was The World Ends With You. So just briefly seeing Neku, Joshua, Shiki, Beat and Rhyme, and getting a noise theme Keyblade was more than I ever could have asked for. But after some glorious fan service, we get into the game, and this is where things started to go downhill. There were a handful of new mechanics added in this game, one of which being flow motion, where Sora and Riku can headbutt the nearest wall and gain an incredible amount of momentum in any direction. And my problem with this mechanic was that it did anything but create flow, as most areas in the game were massive to compensate for the increased movement speed, which led to the most wandering and lost I've ever felt in a Kingdom Hearts game before. Take for example the post office in Traverse Town, a huge area where when you enter, the game subtly alludes to where you need to go next. But if you look away for a second and miss that hint, or just don't remember where it was, you could easily be riding rails and bouncing off of walls in this area for the next 10 to 15 minutes. And that is a problem with a lot of the game's areas, where everything is so wide open, and since with flow motion you can go pretty much everywhere, there is no sense of direction like in the previous titles. And I found I was spending just as much time wandering around as I was actually progressing forward, which was a frustrating experience. And that is where my main problem with this title lies, frustration, an almost unhealthy amount as when I played my first time, I disliked pretty much every new mechanic this game had. Flow motion, dream meters, and the drop system, and it got to a point where I was looking at the negative in almost every aspect of the game. Although some of my complaints I still think are justified, like flow motion, and what is the point of the drop system in this game if it gives you an item to avoid it being the drop me not? And even if you do drop, you can just immediately drop back to the other character. I found this mechanic to be completely pointless and would have been better to just remove it altogether, as at any time you can manually drop between characters and the game already doesn't let you progress until you finish a world with both Sora and Riku. But the last thing that pushed me over the edge with this game was the changes to the command deck. It's pretty much the same as Birth by Sleep, but this time you can't cycle through it using the triggers on the controller anymore, rather you have to use the d-pad. Which in later boss fights forced me to hold my controller in double claw if I wanted to move, look, and attack at the same time. As well as for whatever reason, when you use a command in Dream Drop, it moves you down the list instead of up like in Birth by Sleep, which at this point just felt like the game was trying to piss me off. So it was only in the first few hours of the game I noticed all of these problems, and in retrospect, I can't blame all of my frustration on the game. As I noticed I was experiencing what I'll call Kingdom Hearts fatigue, which you could only assume happens when you play all of these games in a matter of 19 days. As I started on February 5th and got to Dream Drop on the 23rd, and you can only play so much Kingdom Hearts going through the same formula every game until you get a bit tired of it. So around the Tron world, I took a step back and realized there's no reason I should be this frustrated playing a game, and decided I wasn't going to let this bad experience ruin the rest of the series for me because I could only imagine if I kept playing, not only would have I have hated the game even more, but I would have brought that same negative and fatigue state of mind into Kingdom Hearts 3, and would have ruined my experience with the game that was the reason why I started all of this in the first place. So I stopped playing and said I would return to the series whenever I genuinely felt excited and optimistic to get back into it and give Dream Drop Distance another chance. And about three, closer to four months later, I returned to the game, hopped in a Discord call with my same friend that got me into the series, started a screen share, and we grinded out the rest of Dream Drop in one night. Pro gamer tip, if you ever need to get through a game you don't like that much, try playing it with a friend, so instead of just being frustrated at it, you can have someone to laugh at the game with and make it feel not so grueling. Which especially helped when playing Dream Drop because I was not able to follow this game's story, so having a Kingdom Hearts expert on hand was pretty helpful and we just laughed at all the nonsense in it. And after learning about the almighty Balloonra spell, I got through this game in about 13 hours, on top of the previous 5 or so hours from February. And by the end of the game, I developed this weird video game Stockholm Syndrome where I was reconsidering my opinions on it and was actually enjoying some of its mechanics like playing with my Dream Eaters and expanding their skill trees and all of that stuff, but I was probably just going insane. So if you couldn't tell already, I was not a fan of Dream Drop Distance, and it was by far my least favorite game in the series after finishing, because not only did I have issues with the gameplay, but also the story. I wanted to wait to talk about story spoilers until we got through all of the games, but we gotta talk about this now, so if you want to avoid Dream Drop Distance spoilers, you can skip to the time on screen now. Earlier in this segment, I mentioned that I felt this game removes any and all rules to the Kingdom Hearts universe, and that's because this game introduces time travel into the plot. And as soon as that was revealed, I already knew this was going to be a train wreck. So I'm not going to pretend like I fully understand this game's plot, as I've watched Oni Black Mage's Dream Drop Distance recap twice already, and a few other videos explaining time travel in the series, and I still have trouble wrapping my head around all of it. So I'm just going to present some of the questions I had while playing this game, and I'm sure some of them can be explained, 
but the fact that after all of this, I'm still not sure what was really happening, I see that as a problem with the game's writing and presentation. So Xehanort travels back in time by casting away his body to meet with his younger self and tells him about the future and how to time travel. And the established rules of time travel so far are that you must only travel as a heart, you can only move back in time to a point where your past self exists, and you cannot change what has already happened in the past of the first time traveling Xehanort. And at this point, I'm already questioning how the first Xehanort to time travel learned about time travel and which Xehanort it was, as the game just says Xehanort did it. Well, there's been a thousand Xehanorts in different periods of time. So from some independent research, which probably isn't right, so don't take any of this as fact, the way I see it is that the first time traveler was Apprentice Terra Xehanort, who after banishing Ansem the Wise and extracting the hearts from himself and the other apprentices, this was him casting away his body, which then allowed him to time travel to go back to talk to teenage Xehanort and then return to present time as just a heart who would then possess Riku to create Ansem's Seeker of Darkness in Kingdom Hearts 1. Which also works to explain who the Hooded Man was in the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1, which apparently is Xehanort from the future as just a heart, which is why it's just like a blob inside a cloak. And I am not believing this at all, that when Kingdom Hearts 1 was written, this was intentionally supposed to be Xehanort from the future. Absolutely no way, because if it was, why wasn't he wearing an Organization 13 cloak? That seems like a way better way to disguise your appearance if you're traveling as just a heart, instead of just this dirty old thing. So besides the question of how did Xehanort know how to time travel, why was his younger self able to travel forward in time to a future that hasn't happened yet in his reality, as well as not having to cast away his body to do so, let alone be able to bring both Ansem Seeker of Darkness and Xemnas with him? I feel like this also creates diverging timelines, which breaks the other rule of not being able to change what has already happened, as wouldn't young Xehanort knowing how to time travel and following a destiny different from his older self change the timeline of the younger Xehanort's world? And I've heard people say that the mainline Xehanort from Birth by Sleep and all of the other games has always known how to time travel because even when he was younger, his future self tells him how. But that just doesn't make sense to me as it creates an infinite loop of future Xehanorts with no origin point. And time travel is just one of the many wacky concepts introduced in this game alongside sleeping worlds, sleeping keyholes, and dreamception. But before half of this video turns into a dream drop plot discussion, we should probably move on. So with that mess out of the way for now, that concludes Dream Drop Distance. It was a long, confusing, and frustrating experience, but we finally got through it, and that brings us to the next game, 0.2 Birth by Sleep, A Fragmentary Passage. Zero Point Two is a one of a kind in the Kingdom Hearts series, as it's not a full game, but rather a three to four hour glorified tech demo showing off the new engine and a glimpse of the combat system that will appear in Kingdom Hearts Three. In Zero Point Two, you play exclusively as Aqua, recounting her time spent in the Realm of Darkness during the events of Kingdom Hearts One. And because this game takes place entirely in the Dark World, it's the only game in the series whose title screen fades in from black with a dark theme, which was a nice little detail. So because Zero Point Two is so short, its story is simple and game gameplay is fairly linear. The way I saw it was that this game's purpose, besides being a tech demo, was to re-familiarize the players with Terra, Aqua, and Ventus, and set up the role they'll be playing in Kingdom Hearts 3, which is pretty big, as in the grand scheme of things, the Dark Seeker saga is just as much about the Birth by Sleep trio as it is Sora, Riku, and Kairi. But onto gameplay, this game felt like an amalgamation of the previous combat system, somewhat refined into one. With character speed from Dream Drop Distance, and attack speed and combos reminiscent of Kingdom Hearts 2, with a splash of Birth by Sleep's exaggerated gravity. So it felt really good, but wasn't by any means a dramatic improvement. I actually found the one thing I enjoyed most about this game's combat was how simple it was, which worked well considering the game's length. Pretty much all you have are your X attacks, magic, and the focus gauge, although there was one new mechanic in this game that would also appear in Kingdom Hearts 3, and I really don't even know what it's called, so I guess I'll just call it the arrow system or situation commands. Where above your command list, after performing certain actions, you will gain arrows, and once you gain three, you will have the option for for a variety of commands like a form change finisher or a more powerful magic spells, and even more than one command can pop up at a time. But after finishing this game, I still didn't really know how this system worked, as sometimes you would gain arrows from finishing combos, other times it would be by killing an enemy, so it just kind of felt like you got them randomly from doing well in combat. And similar to Birth by Sleep style gauge, you would gain an ability based on the attacks you were using. So if you were using thunder a lot and gaining arrows, once you got the prompt for your situation command, you would probably get thundaja. And this brings us 
us to one of my favorite things in this game, which was the visual upgrade to the magic spells. When you use thunder, it felt like you were casting thunder, and same for all of the other spells. I'm not sure if it was just a placebo, but it felt really good and powerful using magic in this game. But it wasn't just the magic that looked good, as I'm sure you could tell, everything about this game looked amazing, which is expected when running on Unreal Engine 4, and it was kind of the point of this game to show off the new graphics. Although the performance was rough at times, which had me worried for Kingdom Hearts 3, as this game ran at like 25 frames per second max on my standard PS4, which sounded like it was about to blast off the entire time playing this game. But that about concludes 0.2, as this game and Kingdom Hearts 3 share a lot of elements, and I want to save those discussions for Kingdom Hearts 3. So overall, 0.2 was a really enjoyable few hours that looked really good and gave great development to Aqua's character, as well as good setup to Kingdom Hearts 3. So finally, after all of these games, movies, handheld remakes, and tech demos, we have arrived at Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, the mobile game. So I didn't actually install and play Union Cross until after finishing Kingdom Hearts 3, but the very last piece of content before Kingdom Hearts 3 was Kingdom Hearts Back Cover, another movie included on the 2.8 disc, which was an introduction to the lore of Union Cross and takes place hundreds of years before even Birth by Sleep during the Age of Fairy Tales in the world Daybreak Town. So the events of Back Cover are fairly irrelevant to the overall Dark Seeker saga, at least for now, as only a few things brought up in this movie find their way into Kingdom Hearts 3, like the Book of Prophecies, some lore to the no-name Keyblade, and most importantly, the game's epilogue. So I feel like this movie's purpose, besides obviously introducing us to a whole lot of characters from the Age of Fairy Tales, as well as providing context to some plot points that will arise in Kingdom Hearts 3, was to set up the next saga in the series, being either the Lushu or Master of Masters saga, depending on whoever takes up the role of evil bad guy after Xehanort. So although this movie was disconnected from all of the games I've been playing, I was surprised to see that back cover was by far the most enjoyable and comprehensive hour of storytelling in the entire series. That tells a really interesting story with all new characters and twists and turns that will inevitably tie into the series' future titles. But that about concludes back cover as well as the 2.8 disc, which brings us to the next game in the series, and the game that inspired me to begin my journey, Kingdom Hearts 3. Remember in the beginning of the video when I said how playing through an entire series from the beginning just to play the latest installment is an incredibly fulfilling experience? Well, when I booted up Kingdom Hearts 3 for the first time and got to that title screen, it made every hour put into the previous titles feel so worth it. Before I even started the game, I was already having a bittersweet experience as I was happy I finally made it to the game I really wanted to play, but I also had a feeling that the best may have already been behind me as I enjoyed some of the previous titles so much more than I expected to, but the little worry and doubt I had was pushed to the side as I was ready to fully enjoy this game I spent so much time and energy to get to. So finally, after two mainline entries, three handheld games, three movies, one tech demo, a handful of YouTube videos, and five months later, we have arrived at the game I actually wanted to play. Kingdom Hearts 3. So what better place to start than the opening cinematic, which I thought was really cool using young Zane or in Ericus's game of chess as a metaphor for all of the events leading up to Kingdom Hearts 3, resulting in some incredible visuals as well as a decent reminder of the past events happening in chronological order. Face My Fears was also an incredible song right up there with Simple and Clean and Sanctuary. But now onto the game. Kingdom Hearts 3 was the first game in the series I decided to play on proud mode for my first playthrough because I had heard this game was way easier than the previous titles, and at at this point, I felt like I was ready for more of a challenge anyways with all of my experience. So the game begins following the events of Dream Drop Distance with a tutorial akin to Kingdom Hearts 1, which felt like a real celebration of the series. But then we get into the story where Sora is recovering from his fight against the darkness, and according to Yen Sid, has lost most of the powers he's gained throughout the years and needs to train to recover them, but most importantly, recover the power of waking. So that right there is the purpose for 80% of this game, which is exploring the Disney worlds with little to no plot progression throughout the way, as we regain Sora's strength until the end of the last Disney World, and then the plot makes its first substantial progress only 20 or so hours into the game. So yeah, this is what I was referring to during the Kingdom Hearts 1 segment when I said that giving your journey purpose is seriously ignored as the series continues, and I believe Kingdom Hearts 3 is the worst defender of this problem, which is unfortunate because you'd think as the series continued, it would want to improve upon these aspects and try to make the whole game feel more uniform and connected. But in this case, the problem is ignored 
sword altogether. So as we get more into the game, we use our heart as our guiding key, and we head to Olympus to see Hercules, who should be able to help us regain our strength. And at Olympus is where this game's prologue takes place, titled Kingdom Hearts 2.9, which I thought was pretty funny, as even the game is self-aware at this point of how many entries it's taken to get here. So right off the bat, the game looks phenomenal in all aspects, character models, animations, graphical effects, and environmental art but I wish I could start off this segment talking about a well-written and thoughtful prologue, like I did for the Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 segments. But unfortunately, Kingdom Hearts 3's prologue, although it looked very pretty and the scale of Olympus was incredibly impressive, it's a fairly dull introduction to the game, as the world is extremely linear with little to no sense of free exploration. And really nothing about this world has any major importance to the game's story, but rather focuses on showing the player how impressive the game looks, while giving some tutorial segments along the way. So at least for the first hour or so of this game, looking back at it, it's unfortunate seeing how little substance there actually was. One of the other problems I noticed when playing this game was how the gameplay didn't consist with the narrative, as we're on a journey to regain our strength, but when you actually control Sora, it doesn't seem like he's lost any bit of his power. If anything, he's gotten even stronger since his previous entry and has learned even more techniques, which again pushed Kingdom Hearts 3 further away from some of the things I enjoyed about the previous titles, like how Roxas was slow and sluggish with the Keyblade because he's never used one before, but Sora, after awakening, is as strong as ever, and you can really feel the difference in their power. But that brings us into gameplay and some of the new mechanics in Kingdom Hearts 3, and one thing I can give this game credit for is that it does not shy away from its past, but rather embraces all of the previous games and has a little bit of everything in its combat system. Maybe even a bit too much, as another one of the things I noticed after this game's prologue was just how much stuff the game gives you. You have flow motion, focus gauge, form changes, secondary form changes, form change finishers, standard magic, grand magic, dream eaters, and Disney links, character limits, and Disney attractions thrown in for good measure. And you have all of these resources, except links, which are essentially just summons, right at the beginning of the game. So that was the main reason the concept of regaining Sora's strength bothered me, but I suppose it works to make gameplay fun right from the start. So the new mechanics added in this game, or at least the most predominant ones, are the arrows or situation commands, links, and the slightly different focus gauge and flow motion. Starting with situation commands, they function similarly to 0.2, being almost random or at least programmed in a way that give the illusion of being random. Although certain commands like form changes and grand magic can be controlled consistently, I found the limits in Disney attractions would pop up at random regardless of my actions or performance. But staying on situation commands as there were a few new mechanics bundled in with this one, like the Keyblade form changes, which felt like a combination of dry forms from Kingdom Hearts 2 and form changes from Birth by Sleep, and I really liked them as they were flashy, fun to use, and changed up your combos and attack styles, as well as made for a ton of variety in combat, as in Kingdom Hearts 3, you can have up to three Keyblades equipped at a time, and quickly switch between them in combat, even while you're in a form change, making it so you can be juggling three different forms at a time, all having different strengths and styles, which for me, made for the best combat experience in the series so far, at least from a casual player's perspective. But for how much I enjoyed the variety and style of the combat, there were still a handful of things I didn't like about the situation commands, most notably being the Disney attractions. I felt like these things were the unnecessary extra whipped cream on top of an already overflowing frappe, as the game already gives you an abundance of situation commands with flashy, over-the-top visuals, so adding the Disney attractions just seemed pointless as none of them were even that fun to use. Sure they look cool the first time you use them, but after that I found myself just ignoring them for the rest of the game and were just another command I would have to cycle through to get to the one I wanted, as well as they made an already easy game on proud mode even easier, and I wish there was an option to disable them on difficulties outside of critical. But that's about all for situation commands, a decent mechanic with mid-combat goals and achievements that was really the star of this game's combat system with its keyblade form changes, but it just felt a bit overcrowded and unpredictable at times. As for the new focus gauge, it's pretty much the same as Birth by Sleep, but now has a new mechanic built in called air stepping, where Sora can quickly lock onto faraway targets and almost instantly close the gap, which was a great feature, but also kind of a necessity considering how a lot of the areas and boss fights were designed in this game. Later in the game, I also found air stepping to be a really cool mechanic for comboing, as once you're done attacking an enemy or after you kill them, you can slow down time, select your next target, and then immediately get right in their face, which was really cool and unlike combat from the other Kingdom Hearts games. As for the last new mechanic I wanted to talk about, we have flow motion, and you guys already know I didn't like flow motion in Dream Drop, so you can only imagine I was a bit nervous when I saw it was making a return in a mainline entry. But thankfully, Kingdom Hearts 3's flow motion wasn't that bad at all, 
all, and you could go pretty much the whole game ignoring it if you didn't want to use it. It also helped that it was severely nerfed in this game, giving you nowhere near the same momentum as in Dream Drop Distance. And you even had the option in your abilities to disable certain actions that would trigger flow motion. But I've mostly been referring to flow motion in combat, while outside of combat, this game has a ton of situation-based flow motion use, like rail riding, wall running, and air stepping, which was pretty good and fit the fast-paced and flashy design of Kingdom Hearts 3. But it was ugly when the game visualized what structures were wall runnable by giving them a flowy, clear overlay, which for me ruined the aesthetics of a lot of areas, especially Twilight Town, where everything looks gooey. But to summarize my thoughts on KH3's mechanics and combat system, I feel like it would have been better for this game to have an approach of addition by subtraction, as in maybe remove some of the more unnecessary features like limits, attractions, and flow motion in combat, and instead add more depth and refinement to the more core mechanics like the base combat, form changes, and links. So instead of having seven or so flashy surface level mechanics, maybe just three or four that can really be mastered through experience and are more satisfying to learn. But speaking of how less can actually be more, that is exactly this game's design philosophy when it comes to its worlds, as Kingdom Hearts 3 has the least amount of Disney worlds out of all of the main entries, only having six, or seven if you include Olympus. But without a doubt, they are the best Disney worlds in the series. So as we get into Kingdom Hearts 3's level and world design, unlike the previous segments where I gave my general thoughts on all of the worlds as a whole, for Kingdom Hearts 3, because the worlds are so different this time around, I'll be giving each of them their own short discussion, going in order that I played them. So starting with Olympus, I already mentioned its linear design that I didn't really like that much, almost like the game was playing itself, and I was just there to look at all the cool things happening around me. But it did have a nice sense of progression, climbing and wall running your way to the summit, while getting a feel for how the game plays. Next was Kingdom of Corona, which was by far the most beautiful world in the game, taking place in a massive forest with large grassy landscapes and flower meadows you can descend through. The pacing was also spot on, never lingering too much on a single type of gameplay or enemy type throughout its 1-2 to two hour playtime, as you go from basic smaller enemies to calm segments being able to take in the environment, then back to combat for a mini boss, and then you reach the city for some storytelling and mini games, and then after that the first combat loop repeats, ending with the world boss, which was just alright, and when having to wall ride on the tower, the camera could get a bit disoriented, and there was a trend in this game for a lot of the early boss fights where you'll be spending a lot of your time in the air, and the boss is much bigger than you, and they're just kind of annoying to fight, but thankfully there's only a handful of them. Next was Toy Box, which really nailed the Toy Story art style and combining it with Kingdom Hearts, which at times made me feel like I was watching a Toy Story movie during the cutscenes. I also thought this world had the most clever introduction with an advertisement for a game that's totally not Final Fantasy Versus 13. And this was also a fun reference to the beginning of Toy Story 2, I believe. But as for the world's design, it's broke up into just two areas, being Andy's room as well as the outside street area and the massive toy store, which is essentially the whole world, as you only spend around 10 minutes or so in Andy's room. And for whatever reason, I really thought there should have been a driving segment in this world, like a mini game where you can ride an RC car to the toy store, which was one of the most iconic moments from the movie. But it wasn't in the game and you just walk to the toy store? I totally think they could have added a driving segment here and it would have been a fun reference to the movie and a better, more engaging way to get to the toy store than just walking there off screen. But anyways, at the toy store is where the world really begins as you explore the three levels and see new environments through whatever type of store you're in. And I usually don't enjoy mech or power suit segments in games that much, but the toy mechs were surprisingly really fun and offered a handful of gameplay options and combos with different styles for different mechs. They also helped to keep combat varied as there was a lot of fighting in this world without a lot of diversity in setting. Woody and Buzz were also some of the best companions in the Kingdom Hearts series and really felt like their movie versions, which made the original story in this world feel a lot more engaging than the others. Next up was Frozen, which was probably my least favorite world in the game as it really lacked any sort of Kingdom Hearts charm and felt very restricted to its source material. Like, Sora didn't even get a new outfit for exploring a snowy mountain and ice castle, not even a scarf for Parka. The world was also fairly bland and felt too similar to Corona, as instead of a big forest, it's now a big snow forest, and unlike how Kingdom Hearts in the past has seamlessly blended itself into its Disney worlds, this world just felt like an advertisement for the movie with little to no creative freedom. Next was Monstropolis, the Monsters Inc. world that was a great change in pace and design, from big open spaces to more tight hallways and corridors, which was perfect for the industrial factory setting. This world also for some reason had the best story out of any Kingdom Hearts world ever, and really a better story than the whole game if I'm being honest, as Randall wants to revert back to using screams as an energy source instead of laughter, because he believes that fear is a stronger and more sustainable emotion in the long term, which is a genuinely interesting argument to be made with some reasoning behind it. 
it. Also, throughout the Disney worlds, the Dark Seekers will randomly appear to give the illusion of plot progression, but it's really just bullshit. And even the game is self-aware of this, as at one point in this world, Vanita shows up, and Sora says something along the lines like, okay, say whatever you gotta say about darkness, and then get out of here already. This is the part where you spout some mumbo jumbo and disappear, right? So my first playthrough of Monstropolis, I kind of rushed through it as I wanted to get to the actual plot of the game, but in retrospect, this was a great world with a nice change of pace and design and storytelling. But this world's story made me realize how inconsistent this game was when it came to the story between Disney worlds, as some were incredibly written and interesting extensions of the movies, but others were just lazy copy and paste of the movie's plot with Sora awkwardly lingering around. Which proposes a few questions like why not have all of the worlds be extension of their movies and was Disney limiting the creative freedom on certain worlds? But anyways, next up is the Caribbean, which by far had the most exploration in any world in the series that really made you feel like a pirate sailing the seas with your hilariously adorable new outfit. The part I enjoyed most about this world was surprisingly the crab hunt that forced you to go explore the town by the pier and its outskirts, and the visuals alone in this segment were enough to keep me interested because it really did look that good. As well as around this part of the world is when I realized that Kingdom Hearts 3 was doing a decently well job and incorporating more platforming elements into this game, but like a more cracked out version of Kingdom Hearts 1's platforming. The only part about this world that really bothered me was the amount of boss fights. I feel like they definitely could have caught one or two from this world for the sake of the player's enjoyment, especially the fight against the Kraken type enemy near the end of the world, which just was not fun, at least for me, and felt like I was trapped in a Disney attraction for a whole five minutes, as your only commands were to slowly shoot at a massive target, look around, and occasionally press square to block. But everything else was fairly enjoyable in this world, even the water segments. Onto the last Disney world, we have Big Hero 6, which was the only Disney movie featured in this game I hadn't seen before, so the world and characters felt a bit foreign and I didn't really know what was happening. But gameplay-wise, I'd say that this was my second least favorite world behind Frozen, as it's essentially just a series of missions you go on completing objectives within a massive city, which looked good and it was fun to scale the buildings with your wall running, but it just felt a bit empty. And the last boss fight was even more gimmicky than the ones that had come before, and really just felt like a flying minigame more than an actual boss fight, even on proud mode. And the city's wide open design was just starting to feel more of the same, but thankfully this was the last Disney World. So once you complete Big Hero 6, you then get a call on your gummy phone, and now the game's real story is ready to begin. And when I realized that this game is essentially broke up into two games, a 25 hour Disney game, and then a 5 hour Kingdom Hearts game, I was honestly shocked at how the developers thought that this was a good design approach especially when the series has been very specific about what titles and what requirements need to be met to be considered a main numbered entry. But that brings us to this game's story, which only really happened during the last few hours of the game, but when it was happening, I was loving it. And because Kingdom Hearts 3 is the conclusion to the Xehanort saga, so many plot points were tied off with big reveals and epic moments jam-packed into this ending with a very satisfying conclusion to Xehanort's character. But my biggest problem with this game, looking back at it in retrospect, is that it does not have a complete story, and in my opinion is the worst of the numbered entries, and even some of the handheld games when it comes to its storytelling. Every other game in the series tells a full story with an introduction, call to action, build up, midpoint, rising tension, climax, and resolution, and are paced accordingly to properly express each act of its story. But Kingdom Hearts 3 just felt like the last chapter of a book, and although it was a really damn good last chapter, I wanted a full story, and that's what I expected from a mainline Kingdom Kingdom Hearts game. And although I did enjoy this game's finale, it's hard to ignore that it's essentially just a boss rush with not even a new original world, as all of the mainline entries have these big massive worlds that you explore like Hollow Bastion and the world that never was. But for Kingdom Hearts 3, we're just at the Keyblade graveyard again, but this time Xehanort makes a maze, so I guess maybe that passes as a new world. But later in the fight, you do go into a new world, Scala Ed Column, which is the world that we saw in the very beginning of the game, where young Xehanort and Ericus were playing chess chess, and I was ready for this Kingdom Hearts 3 final world, explore this beautiful town with gondolas, and a place where it looks like maybe all of this began. But it turns out that this world is pretty much nothing more than a very beautiful boss arena that takes place in a very small area. So I know I've kind of been ragging on Kingdom Hearts 3 for a bit here, but I hope that expressing my issues with the game doesn't give the impression that I didn't like it, because I did really like this game. So now I'll go over a few of the miscellaneous things that I think this game did a good job with 
with, like the new minimalistic UI that was a very nice addition and reflected modern game design, as well as keeping a somewhat Kingdom Hearts feel. I also really love this trend in modern games where they give you some sort of phone or tablet to take pictures with along your journey and store information. In this game, it was in the form of the Gummy Phone, which was just similar to the Sheikah Slate from Breath of the Wild. And speaking of Gummy, the Gummy Ship has now been completely overhauled, giving more freedom and control over your experience than ever. As you're now thrown into an open space where you can choose how you want to travel, either a peaceful cruise to the worlds and avoid fights, or intentionally seek out battles to gain upgrades and items. Although the layout of the overworld in this game tried to be consistent with its UI's minimal design, but for me this just didn't work, having to cycle through different pages to see all of the worlds, and awkwardly trying to select what I wanted to while my selection is moving all over the place because there's no clear up, down, left, and right. Kind of like trying to navigate the Smash 4 menu. And I'll definitely miss the days of slowly navigating my gummy ship around the overworld. But the biggest parts of this game I found the most enjoyment out of was the combat and the Disney worlds, and since those are by far the biggest aspects of the game, I enjoyed Kingdom Hearts 3 a lot. Maybe not quite as much as my first time playing KH1 or 2, but it was by no means disappointing or a bad Kingdom Hearts game. And that about concludes not all but most of my thoughts on Kingdom Hearts 3, and brings us to an end of all of the Kingdom Hearts games I played this year. I mentioned a few times throughout this video I would have a spoiler talk section at the end, and now is the time, so if for some reason you've made it this far without wanting to be spoiled, you can skip to the time on screen now to go to my final thoughts and conclusion. So we finally made it through all of the games, and I really hope you've been enjoying so far, but now it's time to discuss Kingdom Hearts story, and I can definitely say that the series story isn't as complicated or confusing as some make it out to be. Because at the end of the day, the plot can always be boiled down to light versus dark and friendship as power. Although there are a lot of specifics and pretty much every moment in this game's story in every game is substantial in some way, whether it's to explain a character or concept within that same game, or something really random that will happen in 10 years from now. Like replicas, for example, since we're coming fresh off of Kingdom Hearts 3, so replicas were introduced in Chain of Memories with Replicu, which are empty vessels that one can insert a heart or manufactured personality into. I think that's how it worked. I can't remember if in Chain of Memories they had a portion of Riku's heart or something, but I think Replicu was just all made from science. And since replicas were first introduced in Chain of Memories in 358 Days, they weren't really brought up again. That is, until Kingdom Hearts 3, as in this game, replicas are the name of the game, and honestly, it felt like the plot weighed way too heavy on this concept, as they conveniently were able to explain so much nonsense going on in Kingdom Hearts 3, like Xehanort bringing past versions of himself into the present and putting them into replicas. I also feel like this overuse of replicas messed with a few characters whose stories have already concluded, like in Kingdom Hearts 2 when Roxas and Naminé went back into Sora and Kairi. But everything was okay, because as long as Sora and Kairi were together, so could Roxas and Naminé, and I thought that was a perfect conclusion and really solidified that nobodies are destined to a more tragic reality and have to accept that they're not their own person, and that's just the way things are. But in Kingdom Hearts 3, you forget all of that development and self-acceptance and just put everyone in replicas. But I understand these are great characters that a lot of people wanted back in the story, and I really shouldn't be complaining that Roxas is his own person again because he is one of the best characters in the series. But I just wish that sometimes the series would stick to some of its more mature themes presented in the games like 358 Days over 2 and Birth by Sleep, as at the very end of Kingdom Hearts 3, when everyone is together at the Destiny Islands, it felt a bit too perfect, with even Shion coming back alive, which made the concept of death in the series even more diluted than it already was. As throughout this entire story, the only character who's really died was Master Ericus, and at this point they totally could bring him back if they wanted to. Just have either Terra, Aqua, or Ventus use the same time travel method as Xehanort, which apparently is as simple as casting away your body, go to the past, tell Ericus how to time travel, then have a replica waiting for him as he arrives in the present. I think that would totally work, considering the quote-unquote rules of the series, the only trouble would be figuring out how to cast away your body, like the ability of the no-name Keyblade, but I'm sure they could figure it out. But back to Kingdom Hearts 3, I did enjoy a lot of the reveals in this game, most notably being that Terra's heart, or soul, or whatever part of him was Ansem's guardian from Kingdom Hearts 1, and when he broke those chains and face-palmed Ansem, that was some serious badass shit. And of course, 
course, the reveal of Zigbar being Lushu from the Age of Fairy Tales and his involvement in these games ever since Birth by Sleep was all part of the role he was given by the Master of Masters, which was just earth shattering and a pretty cool reveal, which is exciting for the future of the series. But how did the foretellers come to present day, as I doubt they were all still alive after all of this time and still wearing the same clothes, because if not, it looks like we were just introduced to another method of time travel, which is completely different from the way Xehanort did it. But speaking of the future of the series, we have the secret ending of Kingdom Hearts 3, which was a great surprise for fans of The World Ends With You, and I can't wait to potentially maybe see Sora fight his way through the Reapers game, but that would also mean that he died at some point saving Kairi, because yeah, that was a thing, Kairi was killed I guess at the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, and Sora had to go save her, and he didn't make it back, but that's pretty much all we know. And speaking of Kairi's character, I really wanted to like her, but the games were making it really damn hard, as she just doesn't do anything, and even when she does get a Keyblade and becomes a fighter, she still needs to be protected by Sora and ends up just getting killed anyways. So ever since Kingdom Hearts 1, I feel like Kairi's character has struggled to maintain relevance in the series and has just sort of been in a weird spot ever since Birth by Sleep and the shift from the focus of the original trio. So I understand I'm just kind of rambling going from topic to topic, but it's hard to approach such a massive story with so many details in an organized manner, and if I really wanted to mention all of the comments I had about the story when I was first playing the games, we'd be here for probably another two hours. So I'll save some of the more specific plot details I have in mind for maybe future videos and better elaborated discussions. But for now, I think it's time to get back to my journey through Kingdom Hearts for some closing words. Earlier this year, I started my journey in the hopes to understand Kingdom Hearts, play a new game all of my friends were talking about, and maybe enjoy a few others I missed out on throughout the years. But what I came out of all of this with was a love and appreciation for what is now one of my favorite series of all time, and discovered some of my new favorite games I will always remember. In the beginning, I never thought I would have grown so attached to these characters throughout the months and genuinely cared about their story, but I think that's the beauty of Kingdom Hearts. No matter how ridiculous this series appears on the outside, it's really a story about connections, everlasting relationships, and the power of the heart, which I know sounds like I'm speaking Kingdom Hearts language, but it's true and it's a powerful message communicated through the games. So I hope my journey will inspire some of you to play this amazing series yourself and remind people that it's never too late to get into Kingdom Hearts. And if you have played the series, I hope hearing about my experience was maybe able to remind people why they fell in love with these games in the first place. And that was my not-so-reluctant journey through Kingdom Hearts. I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you who took the time to watch this video, especially if you made it to the end. I know it was long, but I hope you enjoyed, and while I'm here, how about we wrap things up with some hot takes. Favorite character in the series, Riku. Least favorite major character, Sora, which I feel like I'll have to justify in a future video. And favorite Kingdom Hearts game, I know it's typical, but Kingdom Hearts 2. KH2 is a really amazing game, and there's a reason it's most people's favorite. I made a tier list shortly after finishing Kingdom Hearts 3, and here it is. In retrospect, I would definitely bump KH3 into A tier, but other than that, my opinions have mostly stayed the same. So yeah, guys, I'm now officially a Kingdom Hearts fan, which I really didn't think was going to happen going into this year. So if you're new to this channel, I largely focus on videos about the anime and manga series JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and this was kind of a one-off video, but after playing through this series, I will definitely be making more Kingdom Hearts videos in the future on more specific topics like certain games, plot points, and characters, and especially after Kingdom Hearts Remind releases. But for now, I again just want to thank you all so much for watching, like the video if you enjoyed, share it with a friend who you think might be interested in it, and subscribe if you want to hear me talk more about Kingdom Hearts. So with that said, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'm out. Peace.